Hello everybody, it's Kara from Wild Book Garden, and today I'm here with my quarter three most anticipated releases for 2022. So these are going to be some of the books I'm most excited about from July, August, and September. Um, I'm very excited. I will link the other two videos I've done like this this year down below. Um, as before, these are these release dates are subject to change. Um, I also am going to link all of the Goodreads pages for these books in a pinned comment. And also, as per usual, um, this is going to be a whole mix of things, um, and the amount of information I will have about these books will vary widely. Uh, I also am going to try to do less editing for this one because these videos take a very long time to edit, especially since I am kind of trying to figure out how to describe the books uh, as I discuss them. Um, so we'll see how that goes. I really don't want this video to go up like a month and a half late. I'd like to break that streak. Um, so let's get into it, starting off with the July books. On July 5th, I have Lark and the Wild Hunt by Jennifer Adam. Um, this is a middle grade fantasy book following our main character Lark and her brother goes missing while on the wild hunt in a forest um, and she's been told never to trust the fae but she ends up um, kind of joining forces with a fae boy uh, named Rook and she's going to try and get her brother back. Um, it says to save her brother she'll have to trust Rook even if it takes her into the dangerous fae kingdom where she'll untangle riddles, navigate labyrinths, and face the wicked king himself. Um, from the author of The Last Wind Witch, Lark in the Wild Hunt is the perfect blend of classic folklore and new twists, with a protagonist who will show readers that failure is nothing to fear, and resilience, bravery, and friendship can overcome even the most daunting adversaries. I think that sounds wonderful. I have a good feeling about Jennifer Adams' books. Um, my lovely friend Julia actually gifted me uh, her previous novel, The Last Wind Witch, and I haven't read it yet, because <laughs> I'm a bad booktuber, um, but I'm still very excited for this one. Also, I just really like this kind of like fae story, so I think that'll be good. Then I think also on July 5th, yes, um, I have a nonfiction book that is called Millennial Nuns, Reflections on Living a Spiritual Life in a World of Social Media um, by the Daughters of St. Paul. Um, so this is, I think, pretty much what it sounds like in the title. Um, I'm really interested in this kind of nonfiction. I find it very interesting to see people talk about um, the way that having a religious or spiritual practice in the modern world is very different and very complicated. Like basically that there are unique circumstances and challenges about um, about having a religious or spiritual practice in today's world. And I think that sounds really interesting, um, especially as that pertains to social media. Sorry, am I leaving enough room for pictures? I hope so. Does that look right? I don't know what I'm doing. Um, let's see, next one is also on July 5th, uh, What Souls Are Made Of, a Wuthering Heights remix by Tasha Suri. I am so excited for this, you guys. Like, Wuthering Heights is one of those books that I acknowledge its many problems, and yet it just, like, kicks me in the feelings every time I read it. And I love Tasha Suri, so the idea of having a Wuthering Heights retelling by an author I love, I just, I can't wait. Um, also, if you guys have read Wuthering Heights or heard kind of about some discussion or scholarship, um, it is, I think strongly implied, at the very least it is suggested as a possibility that Heathcliff um, is actually a person of color uh, based on his descriptions and the way people treat him and talk about him, and I am just really interested to see an author um, like tell a story from that perspective. Um, Heathcliff in this version is the abandoned son of a Lascar, which, who is, who's a sailor from India. I believe Catherine might also be a person of color, um, and it's about their like love for each other. Um, I'm just really interested to see how this goes. I'm very excited. Um, I've been anticipating this book since it was announced. Like, I I'm, I can't wait. Uh, and then also on July 5th, that's a big release day, obviously, is Nora and the Immortal Palace by M.T. Khan. Um, this is a middle grade fantasy following our main character, Nora, who lives a very hard life. Um, and one day there's a collapse or like a, a cave-in um, in some mines near where she lives, like where um, some of her family and friends work. Four kids, um, including her best friend Faisal, are claimed dead. Nora refuses to believe it and shovels her way through the dirt, hoping to find him. Instead, she finds herself at the entrance to a strange world of purple skies and pink seas, a portal to the opulent realm of Jinn, inhabited by the trickster creatures from her mother's cautionary tales. Yet they aren't nearly as treacherous as her mother made them out to be, because Nora is invited to a luxury Jinn hotel where she's given everything she could ever imagine and more. Um, but then it describes how there's something weird going on, maybe Maybe the hotel is not so perfect. Um, I just think it sounds really, really interesting, like a portal fantasy with kind of a rescue mission um, and also incorporating gin. So I think that sounds great. Let's see. Um, a Lady's Guide to Fortune Hunting by Sophie Irwin. This comes out July 12th um, and this is a historical romance. And um, I, like, as you can tell by the title, our main heroine is determined to get a rich husband. And one of the things that drew me to this book, because um, I'm pretty particular about romances, or like I'm still, like I know what I like, but I'm not yet good at finding what I like based on synopses. 
Um, but one of the things that really drew me to this one is I saw in reviews somebody talking about how one of the things they really liked about it is that Kitty, the main character, uh, the heroine, she never like apologizes for the fact that she is fortune hunting because like that's what her options were, um, which I just really like the idea of that. And I don't remember that much about the male lead. Let's see. Oh, I think, okay, so he knows that she's a fortune hunter and so he's trying to, I think, oppose her but obviously they fall in love. Also on July 12th, I have The Star That Always Stays by Anna Rose Johnson. Um, this is a historical fiction book following a Native American girl. She's Ojibwe specifically. Um, and I actually heard about this one because I saw my friend Julia from Shakespeare and Such added on Goodreads and I'm like, that looks really interesting. So now I'm really interested to read it. Um, and I know that this is based on the author's, I think, grandmother. Um, like her story or maybe great-grandmother. So her main character is named Norvia and her mother forces her to pretend that she's not native at all because I think her mother has remarried into a white family. Um, I just think this sounds really, really interesting. I haven't seen a ton of Own Voices reviews yet, but the ones I have seen seem to be pretty good. So that's encouraging. And yeah, I just always excited to read um, more historical fiction that centers native voices and native stories. So I think this sounds really good. I also really like this cover. Then on July 12th, again, um, I have a kind of republished book, I guess. This is the US release of a book that has been out in the UK for a long time, and that is Eat Up, Food, Appetite, and Eating What You Want by Ruby Tendo, um, who's one of the winners of the Great British Bake Off, which I have never seen, but I am really interested in Ruby Tendo. Um, and this is a nonfiction book about, like it does have recipes, but it's also like a memoir and kind of like a guide to like intuitive eating and like listening to your body and not treating food as a source of shame and I just think this sounds really fantastic. Yeah, so it looks like it's a collection of essays uh, but it also includes some recipes and it talks about like mental health, body image, um, rejects snobbery surrounding good and bad food. Um, I just think this sounds fantastic, really healing and really important. So I am very excited that this is getting published in the US. I've been excited about that for a while and I'm glad we have um, an edition coming out here. And then on July 19th, I have another like retelling by an author I love that I've been excited about since it was announced basically. Um, that is The Daughter of Dr. Moreau by Sylvia Moreno-Garcia. This is a retelling of The Island of Dr. Moreau, which I have not read and I don't have interest in, but I am a Sylvia Moreno-Garcia fangirl. Like I will pretty much read what she writes regardless of genre. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited about this. I don't know, like I, I read the whole synopsis at one point but I don't remember it and it kind of doesn't matter. Um, I'm a little nervous based on some of the experimentation stuff that is part of the original story, but from what I've read from this author before, I feel like she's really good at handling dark ideas in a way that doesn't sugarcoat them, but that also doesn't like, um, I don't know, sensationalize them, I guess, like at least in my opinion. So very excited for that one. I, yeah, can't wait. Uh, July is a good month, you guys, because next I have another one of my most anticipated releases for the whole year. Uh, that is A Darkness at the Door by Intisar Kanani. That comes out July 21st and I can't wait. This is the sequel and like concluding volume to, um, what is it? The Theft of Sunlight is the first book and it's also connected to a another book called Thorn, um, although this is a standalone duology. Like you can read these books without having read Thorn. Um, yeah, the way the first one ended, like I have been stressed and excited for this book since I finished that one. Um, my friend Hannah got me into this series and she even warned me about the cliffhanger and like I thought I was prepared and I wasn't. <laughs> but we don't have to wait anymore, so if you've been waiting to jump on the series, now is a great time. Um, I don't want to get into the synopsis for this one obviously, but it's gonna be, I think, uh, very high stakes. We found out some things in the first book um, that are having repercussions here. <laughs> and um, yeah, I love the way Intisar Kanani writes. I am very excited to read this one. I'm stressed for these characters. I love them so much. Okay, and then on July 26th, I have Violet Made of Thorns by Gina Chen. Also a really, really gorgeous cover. Uh, and this is a fey book. Um, we're following our main character, Violet, who is a prophet and a liar, influencing the royal court with her cleverly phrased and not always true divinations. Um, and it sounds like she has a very conflicting, but um, possibly romantic relationship with Prince Cyrus, who is, I think, the fey prince. I don't know if Violet is a human, human or a fey. So then um, Violet is asked by the king to falsely prophesy Cyrus's love story for an upcoming ball. But then Violet awakens a dreaded curse. And um, yeah, I think she and Cyrus have to like team up to try and defeat this curse. I just think it sounds good. Um, it is unsurprisingly compared for compared to The Cruel Prince, which I have really enjoyed that series. So I think this sounds good for me. 
Then I have another sequel. Um, on July 26th, I have The Man or the Monster by Amna Qureshi. This is the second and I think the final book in the Marquesar Trials series, which is a retelling or reinterpretation of The Lady or the Lion. No, The Lady or the Tiger, I think is the original story. And then this version is The Lady or the Lion. I think that's how it goes. Um, yeah, the first book was The Lady or the Lion, which I did enjoy. But I said when I reviewed that one that some things about how I feel about that book are going to be determined by how things play out in the sequel. So I'm very interested to see how that goes. Um, at the end of the first book, there was a big decision made that we don't really know what happened. And we're now going to be seeing the outcome of that. Um, if you know anything about the original story, you can probably guess what that is. But yeah, very interested to see where this goes. Um, and I think those are all of the July books that I have. There weren't as many as often happens. Um, okay, so now moving into August, which I have a lot more for August. Buckle up, everyone. Um, okay, so August 2nd, I have Wild is the Witch by Rachel Griffin. I have not read <laughs> Rachel Griffin's other novels, so maybe this is premature, but I just think this sounds really interesting. Um, our main character is a girl who, like, there's this guy who, like, really, <laughs> I think they really don't get along. He really annoys her, and she ends up kind of on a whim making a curse for him, but she's not intending to actually use it. She just kind of does it to like get her feelings out. But then something goes wrong where the curse actually um, like gets activated or like it gets taken from her uh, by an owl, <laughs> I think. And so now she has to try and get it back so that the curse does not like actually come to pass. Um, and this guy who she really doesn't like doesn't realize, like he's helping her get it back. He doesn't realize that the curse is like being placed on him. And as they travel together, um, the main character ends up finding out like maybe he's not so bad after all. Um, obviously there's going to be some drama when he finds out who the curse is for. Um, I just think it sounds really interesting. Then let's see, on August 2nd also, um, I have My, My Imaginary Mary by Cynthia Hand, Brody Ashton, and Jody Meadows. This is the second in their Mary series. Um, and I, <laughs> so this is about follows a few different main characters. So it follows Mary Shelley as one of them. I think she's like the central one, which I hate Frankenstein. <laughs> like I respect what Mary Shelley did for science fiction, but I hate Frankenstein. It's one of my least favorite books I've ever read. I think it's incredibly overrated <laughs> as a story, like as a story itself, you know, not for like what it did for literature. Uh, but I have enjoyed other books in this series before, so I still want to give it a try. So we're following Mary Shelley. Um, also Ada Lovelace, who I really, I really like. And then there's like an automaton that Ada has invented. Um, and then the like fantasy aspect, so there's like some sci-fi in this one, which makes sense. And then the fantasy aspect is that Mary and Ada learned that they are both fey, magical people with the ability to make whatever they imagine become real. So I think that's interesting. Um, they actually end up creating like this automaton who's named Pan. Um, they actually bring him to life. Um, and then all three of them are hunted by a mad scientist who won't stop until he finds out how they made a real boy out of spare parts. Um, so I think this is gonna be really fun. I tend to enjoy their humor. And like, I, I have enjoyed other books in this series so much that even though I don't like Mary Shelley, I am intrigued to see where this one goes. Um, also a very cool cover design. Okay, then another one of my most anticipated releases on August 2nd, I have It Sounds Like This by Anna Mariano. I have not read her other contemporary novel yet, but I really love her Love Sugar Magic series. And this is a marching band story. Um, and we have an ace main character. Um, it's, I think, a very, very loose interpretation of Snow White, um, but very loose. And yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's about our main character, Yasmin, who says steps off on the wrong foot when she reports an anonymous gossip Instagram account harassing new band members and accidentally gets the entire low brass section suspended from extracurriculars. So I think that she has to jump in and help and like replace these players with, um, it says a gaggle of rowdy freshman boys who are just as green to marching and playing as she is. But then it looks like the uh, secret gossip campaign starts getting um, a lot more aggressive. Um, then there's the end of semester band competition. And also I said that the main character is asexual. I know at least that the love interest is. I'm pretty sure that the main character is as well. And it also, it looks like it's going to be one of those that has like the love interest swap because um, she initially joins the band because she has a huge crush on the drum major. Um, and then I think the, she ends up spending time with another guy instead. And y'all know I have recently discovered <laughs> or remembered that I really, really like it when that is done well. Like the, the love interest fake out, I really enjoy. Then on August 2nd, uh, How to Date a Superhero and Not Die Trying by Cristina Fernandez. Um, this is a contemporary with a little bit of speculative element because obviously there is a, su a superhero um, element in this book. And our main character is, I believe, a freshman in college. Um, and it's just about like, 
how, how to combine your real life or like regular life with the fact that you're dating a superhero. I've been excited about this concept for a while, like since I heard um, about this book, so I think that'll be very good. Um, then also on August 2nd, I have Hearts of Briarwall by Krista Jensen. Uh, I actually have an arc. So I was kindly sent an advanced copy from the publishers. I will be reading and reviewing this soon, um, but this is a proper romance um, about our, like it's set at the turn of the century and our heroine is really into cars. Um, and then our hero is I think also into cars and he ends up like, I think so they end up getting connected somehow through like a business venture that he's trying to start with maybe her brother or something. Yeah, I think that's what it is. So I just think this sounds really fun. Um, also suffrage is mentioned on the back and I really like that. I really like that, um, that time in history. I like learning about that. So I think this will be really good. I have tended to really enjoy the books from this proper romance line. Also on August 2nd, I have Mademoiselle Revolution by Zoe Sivak. Um, this one has a really, really interesting concept. So our main character, um, is Sylvie de Rosier, who is the daughter of a rich planter and an enslaved woman, um, which there were actually, this is like a great example of how like the historical accuracy argument for not including people of color in historical fiction doesn't make sense because there were actually a lot of non-white non people, um, in Europe. And this is an example of how that could happen is oftentimes, um, wealthy landowners would have mistresses um, in like their plantations, like uh, in the Caribbean or something. And they would often have children with them who would then come to the mainland. So anyway, just like a little, little note there. Um, but so our main character Sylvie is from Haiti. And then after the Haitian revolution, um, her and her brother like flee and they end up coming to uh, Paris. So Sylvie quickly becomes enamored with the aims of the revolution, as well as with the revolutionaries themselves. Most notably Maximilien Robespierre and his mistress Corn Cornelie. Uh, do play. I'm not sure how to say that. I'm sorry. Um, and I just, I think that sounds super interesting. It's going to talk about the French Revolution. Um, there is a sapphic relationship, it seems like, and it looks like it's going to discuss a lot about the, like, ideals of the revolution versus, like, things that actually happen. Um, because obviously Robespierre was not a super nice person and he didn't actually stick to all of his ideals. Um, so yeah, I just think this sounds super, super interesting. And then... Uh, also on August 2nd is another one that I have a copy of, but I don't have it with me. <laughs> um, but that is A Coup of Tea by Casey Blair. So this actually is one, like I, I backed the series on Kickstarter. So I did, um, I do have those books, but I think the like normal, like official publication date, um, I think is going to be August 2nd. I, I should check on that. Um, but this is the first book in the Tea Princess Chronicles that is a cozy fantasy series about a girl who doesn't really feel up to her princess responsibilities. So she ends up leaving and um, working at like a tea shop, I think. But then I think it's about how she learns to like use her like power and her privilege for good. Um, one of the things that really drew me is the description, a cozy fantasy series full of magic tea, friendship, and lifting people up even when the odds seem impossible. I think that sounds really lovely. Um, I also really like the cover designs for these and yeah, I'm excited. Um, I do actually own these books already, so I should start those soon. Um, and then on August 4th, I have Daughter of Darkness by Catherine Corr and Elizabeth Corr. This is the first book in the House of Shadows duology, which is inspired by the mythology of ancient Greece. Um, I am still not tired of mythology retellings or like inspired stories, so I'm excited for this. I have, I actually own another book that these two sisters wrote, um, which I have not read yet, uh, but this sounds like a really interesting take on the Orpheus and Eurydice story because um, Orpheus is actually, I think, depicted as like the tyrant ruler in the mortal world, but he says, um, whoever can retrieve his dead wife Eurydice from the underworld will get like fortune and freedom. So our main character Dana uh, jumps at the chance, but to win she must enter an uneasy alliance with a group of fellow severers she neither likes nor trusts. Um, and so severers are soul severers who serve the god Hades on earth. Um, she shepherds, it looks like, dying souls from the mortal world into the older world. On August 9th, I have a nonfiction book, In the Margins, A Transgender Man's Journey with Scripture by Shannon T. L. Kearns. I think this is what it sounds like. It's a memoir by a transgender man um, describing his experience with Christianity. Um, and specifically, I believe he does become... I think he does become a pastor. At least that's my <laughs> assumption based on the cover. Um, but regardless, it sounds really interesting. I've mentioned how I really want to read um, more like theological nonfiction by queer folks. And this sounds really fantastic. Um, it weaves like memoir and also um, different biblical narratives. And I just think this sounds really, really interesting. It says that um, 
moving the conversation beyond transgender inclusion to demonstrate the unique and vital theological insights transgender Christians can provide the church. Um, I just think this sounds fantastic, so I'm very excited for that. Then also on August 9th, I have a series finale that is Empty Smiles by Catherine Arden. This is the fourth and final book in her Small Spaces series, which is a middle grade horror series where each book is like themed around a different season. Um, this is the summer one. Not really a fan of that cover, but it is certainly effective. Um, and I'm just, yeah, I'm really excited for this. We had some big things happen at the end of the third book, which I kind of saw coming. I was so like, I was frustrated, but not as frustrated as if I didn't expect this kind of thing. Um, but I have been really enjoying the series and me and my friend Katie from A Sea of Tomes have been buddy reading it. So really looking forward to finishing that series. Um, then one that I, this might also be one of my most anticipated releases. Um, also on August 9th, we have a, a Korean American in Joseon Court by Monday Awusu. Um, this is obviously a reference to a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain, which I have not read. Um, but I just think this sounds fantastic. So it's about a Korean American girl who ends up getting transported back in time to the Joseon era of Korea. And I just, I think this sounds fantastic. It reminds me like just a little bit of my favorite K-drama, which is The Great Doctor. And I oh, I just think this sounds great. So it says, a YA contemporary novel set in Joseon, but filled with K-drama tropes and enemies to lovers love triangle and time travel. Like I love a time slip romance. So I'm very, very excited for this one. Uh, a little nervous about the love triangle because we know that I tend to pick the wrong love interest. <laughs> then also in the like fun historical um, subgenre, on August 9th, I have Cake Eater by Alison Dolan. I love this cover. Um, and this is a like futuristic Marie Antoinette retelling that is like all about like fashion and I think social media, um, like court politics, but also like sci-fi. I, I don't know. I think this sounds fantastic. I like there's like a whole synopsis, but honestly, like futuristic Marie Antoinette, I'm already excited. <laughs> Then on August 16th, I have The Drowned Woods by Emily Lloyd-Jones. Um, this is an author I have not read from, and like I've been on the fence about trying um, some of her other books, but this one sounds fantastic. So this is a Welsh-inspired fantasy, um, and our main character is a girl who is a water diviner, and um, she, like her abilities were used like without her knowledge and consent um, to like find wells for an opposing army and then the commander like poisoned them and killed like a ton of people so she has been she's felt like really uh guilty for that it says then mayor's old handler returns with a proposition use her powers to bring down the very prince that abused them both um i think that sounds fantastic and this like the description of characters also really got me it says with a motley crew of allies including a fake cursed young man the lady of thieves and a corgi that may or may not be a spy <laughs> Mare may finally be able to steal precious freedom and peace for herself. After all, a person with a knife is one thing, but a person with a cause can topple kingdoms. Um, I just think that sounds great. It sounds like there's going to be some humor um, as well as some like deep ideas and themes. So I'm just, I just have a good feeling about this one. I'm really excited for this book. Then on August 23rd, I have The Undertaking of Heart and Mercy by Megan Bannon, um, who I didn't realize until after I had already added this book that Megan Bannon wrote um, a couple of other books that I have not read, but I'm very excited to, um, which are The Bird and the F the Bird and the Blade and Soul Swift. I'm interested in both of those. Um, so maybe this will be the first one I read from her. Helen Huang blurbs this as a uniquely charming mixture of whimsy and the macabre that completely won me over. If you ever wished for an adult romance that felt like Howl's Moving Castle, this is that book. Um, yeah, so this is a, like, I don't know why the cover gives me like historical fantasy vibes, because I'm not sure I don't think it's actually historical, um, but it is like a real world plus like magical, I think, combination. Maybe I should just read the description for this one. Hart is a marshal tasked with patrolling the strange and magical wilds of Tenria. It's an unforgiving job and Hart's got nothing but time to ponder his loneliness. Mercy never has a moment to herself. She's been single-handedly keeping Birdsoul and Sun Undertakers afloat in defiance of sullen jerks like Hart, who seems to have a gift for showing up right when her patience is thinnest. After yet another exasperating run-in with Mercy, Hart finds himself penning a letter addressed simply to a friend. Much to his surprise, an anonymous letter comes back in return and a tentative friendship is born. If only Hart knew he's been bearing his soul to the person who infuriates him most, Mercy. As the dangers from Tenria grow closer, so do the unlikely correspondence. But can their blossoming romance survive the fated discovery that their pen pals are their worst nightmares? Each other. Um, I think that sounds really good. I am not always a fan of the like falling in love through letters trope, but She Loves Me is one of my favorite musicals, so I can really like it. I think especially, like it sounds like this one is going to have interactions between them via letters and then also some good interactions with them in person, because that's one of the things that often gets me about that trope is I find it difficult to like, to just like transfer 
all of the emotions just like at the drop of a hat, you know, when they find out who the other person is. So like, I think that's one of the reasons I have trouble with it, but this one sounds like it could be really fun. So I'm excited to try it. Um, then on August 23rd, I have Light Lark by Alex Astor. Okay, this one involves a magical competition. Um, Isla Crown is the young ruler of Wildling, a realm of temptresses cursed to kill anyone they fall in love with. They are feared and despised and are counting on Isla to end their suffering by succeeding at the Centennial, which is the magical competition. To survive, Isla must lie, cheat, and betray, even as love complicates everything. Okay, so it's it offers the six rulers one final chance to break the curses that have plagued their realms for centuries. Each ruler has something to hide. Each realm's curse is uniquely wicked. To destroy the curses, one ruler must die. Um, I like how I gave that synopsis backwards, basically. So I'm sorry, guys, I'm a mess. Um, <laughs> but you know that when you watch these videos. Um, but I just think this sounds super interesting. This also might be one that was independently published or self-published and then got traditionally published. I'm not sure. I feel like it was. Um, but yeah, I think that sounds very good. And then on August 23rd, I have A Dreadful Splendor by B.R. Myers. So this is interesting because B.R. Myers wrote Rogue Princess, which was a sci-fi gender-swapped Cinderella retelling that I thought was very middle of the road. Like, I didn't hate it, but it was just kind of fine. But this sounds like a very, very different kind of story, and like the premise just sounds really good. So I'm excited to try her again. Um, it involves a fake spiritualist who is summoned to hold a seance for a bride who died on the eve before her wedding. But as nefarious secrets are revealed, the line between hoax and haunting blurs. And then I think there is a romance between Genevieve, our main character, who is the fake spiritualist, um, and I think the, the man who was like engaged to marry the woman who died, um, because he apparently was like not really like he didn't actually <laughs> have feelings for her. Uh, also, it turns into a murder mystery. So the last part of the synopsis says, A dreadful splendor is a wickedly whimsical brew of mystery, spooky thrills, and intoxicating romance that makes for an irresistibly fun and page-turning read. I think that sounds really good. Um, then, this is like possibly another of my most anticipated releases. On August 30th, I have Wildbound, which is the sequel and I think concluding volume um, to the Forestborn series by Elaine Audrey Becker. The first book was such a surprise for me last year, like I kind of bought it on a whim uh, because of a very, like a funny story that is, I won't get into now that I talked about before. Um, but I, I didn't know that much about it, but I really, really enjoyed it. This is the companion sequel. The only thing that I'm a little not concerned about, but like hesitant about is I think it follows, it mainly follows Rora's brother, who I like, I don't know that I'll like him as much as Rora. Like, I really enjoyed Rora. I thought her relationship with her brother was interesting, but he could be kind of frustrating in the first book, so we'll see where this goes. Um, but I think we're all, we're still gonna follow Rora and um, some of the other main characters as well. Um, this video is already getting super long, so I won't, like, summarize the first book, but it's a really, really interesting fantasy. It does get uh, pretty dark in some places, um, and yeah, I maybe I'll link to the wrap-up where I talk about the first book, but um, I did really, really enjoy that one, and I'm excited to see how things are going to end. Also, there was a romance subplot that I really, really enjoyed. Then last for August, also on August 30th, I have Belladonna by Adeline Grace. This is the first book in a fantasy series um, that is described as highly romantic, gothic-infused world of wealth, desire, and betrayal. I'm excited. I think that sounds really good. So our main character is a young woman who um, is very, very wealthy and she's kind of been adopted by a succession of guardians, each of whom has met a terrible end. It says, her remaining relatives are the elusive Hawthorns, an eccentric family living at Thorn Grove, an estate both glittering and gloomy. Its patriarch mourns his late wife through wild parties, while his son grapples for control of the family's waning reputation, and his daughter suffers from a mysterious illness. But when their mother's restless spirit appears, claiming she was poisoned, Signa realizes that the family she depends on could be in grave danger, and enlists the help of a surly stable boy to hunt down the killer. However, Cigna's best chance of uncovering the murderer is an alliance with Death himself, a fascinating, dangerous shadow who has never been far from her side. Though he's made her life a living hell, Death shows Cigna that their growing connection may be more powerful and more, irres and more irresistible than she ever dared imagine. I just think that sounds super interesting. Um, also, I kind of get the feeling from that synopsis that there's going to be a multiple love interest situation, uh, which depending on which way things go might be fun. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the video, I have terrible luck with those. <laughs> but I just think this this premise sounds super interesting. Um, and like the genre blend and everything, like murder mystery, fantasy, maybe spooky? I don't know. <laughs> okay, and then finally into September. Um, I'll try to speed this up, you guys. I'm so sorry. Um, on September 2nd, very obviously one of my favorite, uh, most anticipated books of the year, um, probably will be a favorite, is Unraveler by Frances Harding. Um, 
one of my favorite authors. My friend Hannah and I from Ball Gowns and Books have been doing um, our Frances Harding read-along, so this is gonna be the final book that we read, um, her newest release, and yeah, like I really don't need to know that much about it, but the basic overview is that our two main characters live in a world where anyone can create a life-destroying curse, but only one person has the power to unravel them. Um, and one of our two main characters is the person who can unravel curses, which not everyone is happy about, so they're on the run um, in a race to save both himself and all those who have been touched by magic. Another one of my most anticipated releases, I'm telling you, this is a really good quarter. Um, September 6th is Garlic and the Witch by Brie Paulson. This is a sequel to Garlic and the Vampire, which is a graphic novel that I absolutely adored last year. It is just like a drop of love and sunshine and friendship and wholesomeness and it just makes me so happy. I did a whole video talking about that. I will link it below. Um, but yeah, I, I especially think that right now a lot of us can use some of these um, really happy and heartwarming stories. So very excited for this. September 6th I have Eden's Everdark by Karen Strong. Um, this is a very spooky sounding middle grade book. Um, our main character is Eden um, who visits Safina Island, her ancestral home, as a healing balm. Uh, but then she finds an old sketchbook that belongs to her mother that's full with these really creepy pictures. Um, days later, exploring the island alone, Eden follows a black cat through a rift in the bright day. She stumbles into Everdark, a parallel world where the sun never rises, where spirits linger between death and the afterlife, and where everything from her mother's drawings is all too real, especially the Witch of Everdark, who wants to make Eden her eternal daughter. Can Eden find a way to defeat the witch's magic, or will she remain trapped in Everdark forever? I think that sounds super interesting. I also really like this cover. Next, I have a picture book on September 6th, which is Magic, Once Upon a Faraway Land by Mirelle Ortega. Um, I love her illustration style, and so when I heard that she had her first picture book coming out, I like it was an instant want to read. Um, it says it's her own story of growing up near her family's pineapple farm in Mexico, where she learned the true meaning of magic. I, I love her art, so I am excited no matter what, and I also think that premise sounds lovely or premise, you know, it's about her life, but um, then, let's see, on September 6th also I have Moonflower by Kaysen Callender. Um, I really, really loved King and the Dragonflies, which I read from them, I think, last year? I think it was last year. Um, I just, I loved that book and I'm very excited to read more from them, and this is a middle grade book about a character who deals with depression, and this is based on Kaysen Callender's own experience, and I think it is so important that we have books for younger readers that deal with mental health issues because those are things that like kids do experience and like, we don't always think of that as something that can happen when you're that young but it does um and i just think that sounds like really really important so it says moon our main character travels to the spirit realms every night but then the realm is threatened it's up to moon to save the spirit world which sparks their own healing journey through the powerful baffling landscape that depression can cause Moon's mom is trying her best, but is clueless about what to do to reach the ugly roiling of her child's inner struggles. At the same time, though, there are those who see Moon for who they are. Blue, the Keeper, the Magician, Wolf. These creature guides help Moon find a way out of darkness. The ethereal aspects of the story are brilliantly blended with real-world glimmers of light. Slowly, Moon grows toward hope and wholeness, showing all children that each and every one of us has a tree growing inside, that our souls emerge when we discover and fully accept ourselves. Drawn from the author's own experience through depression as a young person, this carefully orchestrated, unique novel is deeply spiritual. Moonflower will challenge you to think beyond traditional storytelling, to reach, to weep, to discover, to cheer this feat of nuanced writing that speaks directly to the heart." Like, I just think this sounds beautiful. Um, I'm sure it's gonna make me cry, <laughs> but I think that sounds fantastic. Um, then, also on September 6th, I have Aces Wild, A Heist by Amanda DeWitt. This is a heist novel with an all asexual main cast. So our main character Jack, um, his family are involved with organized crime, um, but they're trying to, I think, go straight and <laughs> go straight. <laughs> says everything starts falling apart when Jack's mom is arrested for their family's ties to organized crime. His sister Beth thinks it's the Shannon family's chance to finally go straight, but Jack knows that something's not right. His mom was sold out and he knows by who. Peter Carlevaro, rival casino owner and jilted lover. Gross. Jack hatches a plan to find out what Carlevaro's holding, holding over his mom's head, but he can't do it alone. He recruits his closest friends, the asexual support group he met through fandom forums. Now all he has to do is infiltrate a high-stakes gambling club and dodge dark family secrets while hopelessly navigating what it means to be in love while asexual. Easy, right? Um, I just think this sounds great. I'm very excited for it. Then another of my most anticipated releases by one of my favorite authors. Um, on September 6th, I, there is Self Made Boys by Anna Marie McLemore. This is like the only thing that could make me care about The Great Gatsby <laughs> is Anna Marie McLemore writing a retelling of it. But like, look at that cover, you guys. I, I am so excited. Um, so yeah, this is a Great Gatsby retelling where, um, 
Gatsby is a transgender boy and also Nick is in love with Gatsby which like if you've read the original novel is not that much of a stretch and I believe Daisy is also queer and I think she actually um, is white passing so she is related um, I think her and Nick are maybe cousins oh and also Nick is also a transgender boy um, and Nick and Daisy are cousins and so he comes to visit um, Daisy and is surprised to see that she's like living as if she's white um, she lives in fashionable East Egg near her wealthy fiance Tom um, and Daisy has erased all signs of her Latina heritage and now passes seamlessly as white. Like, I love Anna Marie Mockamore, obviously. Um, I always, I think their characterization is fantastic. I love their writing style. I love the way that they incorporate themes and ideas in their stories. This is a very like haphazard summary of this, but basically it's a queer uh, Great Gatsby retelling by one of my favorite authors and it sounds incredible. Then on September 13th, I have a nonfiction book that I heard about from Kazan at Always Doing, Refusing Compulsory Sexuality, A Black Asexual Lens on Our Sex-Obsessed Culture by Sharonda J. Brown. This is obviously a nonfiction book about asexuality and specifically uh, by a black author, which I think is so important. This is a black queer feminist exploration of asexuality and, in, and an incisive interrogation of the sex-obsessed culture that invisibilizes and ignores asexual and aspec identity. Then another nonfiction on September 13th, I have On Repentance and Repair, Making Amends in an Unapologetic World by Danya Ruttenberg. Um, Rabbi Daniel Ruttenberg has written several nonfiction books. I really, really love her memoir, which is Surprised by God. Um, and I've been very excited for this upcoming book from her. So it talks about um, obviously repentance and like forgiveness and like making amends and how that works um, in our modern world and how uh, the idea of forgiveness has often been like weaponized against victims. Um, I just think this sounds really fantastic. And I know that when she was talking about the book, she said um, it's obviously going to focus a lot on the Jewish um, like structure or ideas about repentance um, and forgiveness and all of that, but they would also be useful for non-Jewish people as well. Um, and just like a different way to approach the idea of uh, repentance and repair. So I just think this is fantastic sounding. I'm very excited to have another nonfiction book from her. Then on, also on September 13th, I have The Ballad of Never After by Stephanie Garber. This is the sequel to Once Upon a Broken Heart. I don't know if this is the final book or not, um, but that was such a pleasant surprise last year. Like I took a chance on that one because I had not read anything by Stephanie Garber. I was not sure I would like her stuff, but the premise for this one sounded like something I would enjoy and I really liked it. Um, so obviously this is the sequel. I am intrigued to see where things go. I was a little disappointed by the direction things went at the end of the first book because the author did some things I was hoping she wouldn't, but that doesn't mean this book isn't going to be good, so I'm still looking forward to it. In the Shadow Garden comes out on September 13th. That is by Liz Parker. Um, this sounds like a contemporary fantasy, like kind of along the lines of Sarah Addison Allen, who I still have not read, <laughs> yet I keep comparing books to her books. Um, but yeah, this just is like a generational family story with kind of like small magic. Um, it sounds like it could be very cozy. There's like a family of witches who are known for their shadow garden. The foods they grow have like these magical properties. And it says, on one day every year, a shot of Bonner bourbon will make your worst memory disappear. But 20 years ago, the town gave up more than one memory for the year. They forgot an entire summer. One person died, one person disappeared, and no one has any idea why. As secrets from that fateful summer night start to come to light, there must be a reckoning between the rival Haywood and Bonner families. Oh, okay, so sorry. The people who have the garden and the people who make the bourbon are two different families who are, I guess, rivals. Um, but the only clue Irene Haywood has is in her tea leaves. A stranger's arrival will bring either love or betrayal. I just think that sounds super interesting. I also like that cover. Um, yeah, it sounds like cozy and also mysterious. Uh, then, let's see, on September 13th as well, um, there's As Long As The Lemon Trees Grow by Zulfa Katu. It looks like this is a mostly contemporary novel. We're following our main character, Salama, um, who lives in Syria, and Salama is really anxious to get out of Syria because of all the violence. Um, it says, so desperate that she has manifested a physical embodiment of her fear in the form of her imagined companion, Kauf, who hunts her every move in an effort to keep her safe. But even with Kauf pressing her to leave, Salama is torn between her loyalty to her country and her conviction to survive. Salama must contend with bullets and bombs, military assaults, and her shifting sense of morality before she might finally breathe free. And when she crosses paths with the boy she was supposed to meet one fateful day, she starts to doubt her resolve in leaving home at all. Soon, Salama must learn to see the events around her for what they truly are, not a war, but a revolution, and decide how she too will cry for Syria's freedom. Um, I just think this sounds excellent, very intense, I think, but um, I just think it sounds really important and it's going to reframe this idea of like violence and upheaval and um, how how those things are portrayed in a very specific way um, that is not always sympathetic to why those things are happening. Um, that was a very convoluted explanation, but I think you guys get what I mean. Um, also a beautiful cover. 
Then on, also on September 13th, I have The Gingerbread Witch by Alexandra Overy, who is another author who I have not read, um, but her books sound intriguing. This is a, like, Hansel and Gretel retelling, but like a really interesting take on one. So our main character, Maud, um, is like made out of magic. I, she, I don't know if she's also made of gingerbread, um, but her and the other like creatures um, in Mother Agatha's magical house, which is made of gingerbread, um, they're like created by her. Um, and she'll turn back into gingerbread if anything ever happens to Agatha. And then after a terrible fight, Maud storms off, only to return home to learn that Hansel and Gretel, a pair of witch hunters, have pushed Agatha into the cottage's oven. Um, and then she has to go on this adventure to try and find a way that she and the other gingerbread creations can survive. Um, yeah, this sounds really interesting. It sounds kind of like a combination of The Stone Girl's Secret by Sarah Beth Durst, which I have read and really enjoyed, and also like um, similar to, oh, that book by Grim Lovelies? I think Grim Lovelies, which I DNF'd, <laughs> but the concept of it sounds really interesting. Um, yeah, I just think this sounds like an interesting take on a fairy tale. Then on September 20th, I have Rust in the Root by Justina Ireland, um, which I really, really loved Ophie's Ghosts by her, and I haven't read anything else by her, but this sounds super interesting. Um, it's a historical fantasy sci-fi kind of set in the 1930s, um, and there's like two kind of rival, I guess, factions. One of them is Mechomancy, um, which is like the technology-based magic or power. And then there's also dynamism, which is the like more magical and like traditional kind of mystical arts. And so there's like this conflict and most people seem to agree that mechomancy is like the way forward, the way to like industrialize and everything. But our main character, Laura, disagrees. She eventually applies for a job with the Bureau of the Arcane's Conservation Corps, a branch of the US government dedicated to repairing the dynamism so that mechomancy can thrive. There she meets the Skylark, a powerful mage with a mysterious past who reluctantly takes Laura on as an apprentice. As they're sent off on their first mission together into the heart of the country's oldest and most mysterious blight, they discover the work of mages not encountered since the darkest period in America's past, when black mages were killed for their power, work that could threaten Laura's and the Skylark's lives and everything they've worked for." Um, I just think this sounds like a really interesting concept. It's obviously going to incorporate um, like real world like history and issues in a way that I think sounds really interesting. And like I said, the only book I read from Justina Ireland I really loved, so I'm excited for this. Then on September 27th, I have a sequel I'm very excited about. That is Soul of the Deep by Natasha Bowen. Um, this is another one that I'm not sure if this is the final book or not, but this is a sequel to Skin of the Sea, which I read earlier this year, I think, and really enjoyed. That was a present from my lovely friend Kelly, um, Cozy Reader Kelly, and I just really enjoyed this. This is a very interesting kind of loose take on The Little Mermaid, and it incorporates um, African folklore and um, storytelling and different like mythologies and religions in really, really interesting ways, and this is a sequel. There were some big things that happened at the end of the first book that like just very interested to see where things go. Um, that ending was so good and it also like kicked me in my heart in the best way. <laughs> um, so yeah, very interested to see where this one goes um, and another beautiful cover. Then another sequel I'm very excited for is The Captain by Erin Michelle Skye and Stephen Brown. This comes out September 27th and this is the third and final book in the Tales of the Wendy series. Um, this one, the release date for this one has gotten pushed back a couple times so I don't know for sure it's coming out now. Um, but I think it is. That's the last I heard. Um, this is an indie published fantasy series that is a like historical fantasy blend that I've really been enjoying. It's obviously a uh, Peter Pan retelling and I just think the authors, um, I, I think it's really interesting the way that they're like incorporating the original and changing some things, including some of the issues with Peter Pan, um, like the original novel. And um, yeah, I also really like their writing and the, the characters and everything. Very excited to see how things go and how I feel about certain characters. Um, I've said before, there's like some in this series where like I'm still deciding how I feel about them. Uh, but yeah, excited for that. Then September 27th is another sequel, Cece Rios and the King of Fears by Kayla Rivera. This is a sequel to Cece Rios and what is it? The Desert of Souls, um, which I really enjoyed. It's like a desert, uh, desert fantasy. And um, this book I think is going to be more about our main character and her sister, which I really liked um, their dynamic. I thought that was very interesting. And um, yeah, I don't really need to know too much about the actual premise of this one because I really enjoyed the first book. Um, I think thematically it said a lot of wonderful things about like emotion not being a weakness and how people have different gifts and that is important. Like you should celebrate people's differences. And then finally, I think the last book I have to talk about today um, is Princess of Souls by Alexander Christo. This one is supposed to come out September 27th, and this is like a little bit of a wild card because 
I've only read one book by Alexander Christo, which is To Kill a Kingdom, which was a so like a little mermaid retelling. I liked some things about it, but I didn't love that book. Um, I was a little disappointed in it, but I don't know. I just feel like this could be interesting. It's a Rapunzel-inspired YA fantasy romance about a teen witch groomed to steal souls for an immortal king and the reckless rebellious boy to whom her fate is tied. So our female lead um, is tied by blood to steal souls for the immortal king of the Six Isles. And then our male lead is uh, a soldier in the king's army and he wants to steal the king's immortality and kill the entirety of his court, starting with Celestra, the female lead herself. But when Celestra touches Nox in her very first prediction, she sees her own death alongside his. Their fates are unmistakably intertwined and Celestra is no longer safe in the only home she's ever known. Nox and Celestra will have to enter a turbulent alliance in order to survive long enough to, f to free the Six Isles from King Sareth's clutches and escape the new fate that hunts them. Um, I think that sounds really interesting. I'm not usually a big fan of the, like, I don't know, faded romance trope. Like, I really don't tend to like that, but this, I feel like, feels a little different because it's, like, j we just know that they're, like, fates are connected somehow. Um, which I know that it, it will turn into a romance, but just knowing that it's not like confirmed from the beginning to me feels better. It feels like they actually have some choice in the situation. Um, so I don't know. We'll see how that goes. I'm interested to see some early reviews, um, but I'll take a chance on it. I think it sounds good. Okay. I think that's finally my anticipated releases. Like we didn't have money, many in July and then like August and September are just like all the books. So I'm sorry this was so long uh, and probably very disorganized, but comment down below. Let me know if you're excited about any of these or you found some new books that you're excited for. Let me know a book that you're looking forward to coming out soon or just something you want to read. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you soon with another video and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye!